All right, Genesis chapter uh, 7, excuse me, I only was thinking 9. Genesis chapter 7 is where we are tonight. Um, let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, I already covered this last week, but we notice again we see that word saying, Come unto the ark. So we see that's, that's inferring that God must be in the ark if he's telling Noah to come unto him, which is very comforting to know that God, hey, God's there, and, and I want to be where God is. He's, he's you know, telling me to come into the ark with him. And then we also see near the end of the chapter that God shuts him in. So God makes sure that Noah is safe. And I'm not going to re-preach what I did last week, but it's just really great to know that even in, the, you know, in our darkest times, the times of our worst troubles, that we could take comfort in the fact that God will be with us and that God will help us to get through those tough times. Let's look at, look at verse number two because I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this subject. Um, the Bible says, Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Now, typically when you think about Noah's Ark, you know, there's, we have all these toys, and, you know, it's typically read as a kid's story because it's kind of an interesting story and you've got these animals coming from all over the place and it's a good way to teach kids about different animals and things like that. And it's just kind of fun. But you just think about animals just going two by two in the ark. Just two of every kind. But we see that actually there were certain beasts that came in pairs of seven, not just in, in two. And what separates that is, he says, the clean beasts you shall take by sevens. Now, what I'm going to be kind of explaining today is what, you know, why did he bring in these clean beasts? And there are some people, there's this Hebrews Roots movement that's out there today, and I'm kind of going to be um, explaining why what they believe is false, at least in regards to some of this, um, with, you know, dietary restrictions and everything else. And, um, Basically, some people will teach that the clean beasts, well, they'll say, see, look, even Noah was told to bring seven of the clean beasts because those were the beasts that he was able to eat. And that's why he had to bring more of them because, well, that's what he's going to be eating. So it's only the clean beasts. He wasn't going to eat the other ones. They were unclean. So Noah, you know, God must have had those dietary laws and restrictions in place even back then. This is what they'll say, and they'll turn to a verse like this to say that. But this simply isn't true. Look, if you would, we're going to come back here, but look, if you would, to Leviticus chapter number 11. In Leviticus 11, we're going to see where God lays out his dietary restrictions. And we're not going to read the entire chapter just for sake of time. Um, but if you wanted to, if you're interested in it, Leviticus 11 lays out completely, just spells it out. These animals are clean. These animals are not clean. This is what you're allowed to eat. This is what you're not allowed to eat. God's making a difference between a clean and unclean animal in Leviticus 11. Now, mind you, Genesis 7, we're dealing with Noah. This is way before Moses, way before Levi, way before, you know, Leviticus is the Levitical law that, that is in place um, because the Levites, the sons of Levi, were the priests. Um, that God has ordained to be, to be the ministers unto him that he's set apart. And that's what we're finding in Leviticus, the Levitical law. So when we jump ahead here, we're just going to take a look at this, though, because it's, it's pertinent for what I'm going to kind of go over here. Um, look at verse number one of Leviticus 11. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that ye shall ye excuse me, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And it keeps on going on and on and on through this whole chapter, giving different examples and really setting the 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 whole reasoning behind it so that he doesn't have to list off every single animal known and just telling you this is clean, this isn't. He gives you examples and said, this is why. You know, it depends on, on their feet, if it's a hoof or if it's, you know, if they're cloven, if, you know, and there's, there's this whole, I mean, there's all, all kinds of reasons. And, and again, we're not going to get into all the reasoning behind it tonight. But um, jump down to this verse number 43, because he goes through all this whole list. 
and again, you can read it on your own time if you want, but jump down to verse 43 of Leviticus 11. He says, Ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the beasts, and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that may be eaten, and the beast that may not be eaten. So here, God's, God's laying out His law. And it's very clear what His law is about the dietary restrictions. What are they allowed to eat? What's clean? What's not clean? And God's saying, hey, you're a, you're a holy people. You are a special people, and you are to be set apart, and you are not to defile yourself with what I consider to be an unclean beast. And this is what you need to do, and, and you know, it's thus saith the Lord. This is what we find in the Levitical priesthood. Now, there's some people actually think that these laws are still in effect today. And this is that, that Hebrew roots movement where they kind of view everything in regard to the Old Testament as it's all applicable. They'll say that we should still be observing the Sabbath day. We should still be observing the feasts. We should still, yeah, people will claim to be Christian. It's, so it's Hebrew roots. It's, it's a, they, they, they claim they believe the Old Testament and the New Testament. But they like going back, and th these are the people that will refer to Jesus as Yeshua and Yahweh. And they, they think that, like, well, we have to use, you know, Jesus isn't really his name because the letter J didn't even exist until this, you know, this date, and, you know, all this other stuff. And it's like, his name is Jesus in English, okay? I don't see what the big deal is. You're reading a Bible that's in English. All of these words, none of these words were, when they were originally written down, were in English. They've been translated. But some, for some reason, they've got this problem with the name of Jesus, as you know, it's Yeshua, Yahashua. And, and, and they'll even fight over what the name even should be. And they'll say, well, God is Yahweh, it's Lord. And, and they'll, they'll use this superstition like the Jews do, or, and they get this from who knows where. And it is, it's, it's, it's a lot of just kind of a Jew worship of, of the Old Testament law. And they take things real far, and they think that we need to do some of these things today, even though they've been clearly identified in the New Testament as no longer being applicable. But um, what's interesting, too, about these people is that they won't do the sacrifices. You know, they want to cling to all the old, to the Torah and the Old Testament law, and they'll go to Leviticus and they'll say, and now look, when I say this, mind you, I don't think that all of the law has been abolished because it, it hasn't. There's plenty of the law that still stands today, but there has been a change in the law just as there's been a change in the priesthood. We're under the priest. Jesus Christ is, is of the order of Melchizedek, the Bible says. He's not under the Levitical priesthood. He wasn't of the, true, the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. He's not this type. He is our high priest, but it's not according to this priesthood. It's according to a better priesthood, a higher priesthood. And... Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why we're not obeying the, these type of ordinances today. And again, I mean, I preach an entire ser two sermons actually about understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament. And um, I'm not going to go into all of those different reasons, but these people still believe that. But what's interesting is the hypocrisy. Why aren't they going and, and doing a the sacrifice then? If we need to obey the law, I mean, if they're going to say we need to obey all the law because that was their first and that none of the law has been done away. And see, they'll use the same verse that I'm going to turn to now in Matthew chapter 5. They're going to use this to justify why they think all of the law is to still be followed today, every single bit of it, including the Sabbath, include, you know, except for the sacrifices for some reason. I don't know. And I still, I still don't understand the reasoning for that. But, but how that is okay that, it's, that they don't do that, but everything else the, between the feasts and the Sabbaths and the dietary restrictions and everything else, nope, they need to follow that. Matthew 5.17 says, Think not that I am, Jesus Christ said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. 
So they'll say, see, Jesus come, didn't come to destroy the law. And I say, amen, he didn't come to destroy the law. I agree with that. But that's the verse that they'll use and say, well, th we must follow it then until I'll be fulfilled. And I say, no, because part of the law has been fulfilled. I mean, the biggest example is Jesus Christ, the Lamb, the Passover Lamb, slain once from the foundation of the world. That has been fulfilled. The Bible, the New Testament clearly explains that that was a picture for the time then present of, of sacrificing a lamb, shedding that blood, putting the blood on their doorposts, that, that the angel of death would pass over them. All of these things were representative of Christ that was to come and to shed his blood for the people. And that whosoever was trusting in his blood, they put their faith in Jesus Christ, was going to be saved and, and they would have eternal life. And this is all just pictures and symbolism. And um, it, was, it was doctrine and teaching that they received from these Old Testament practices. But that's not the only thing that was fulfilled. There were plenty of other things. When the Bible talks about the Sabbath, you know, Jesus said, enter into my rest. The Sabbath was a day of rest. We rest from our works. We can't work our way into heaven. We have to take a rest from our own personal works as far as what we're trusting to get us into heaven and to be saved by and put all of our faith in Christ. He is our rest. And we can rest completely in Him. We don't have to, to worry about, am I good enough to be saved? Because we're not. We're resting in the accomplishment that Jesus Christ made when he, when he lived his perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again from the dead. We enter into his rest. The Sabbath was a day of rest, but again, representative of the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. He fulfilled that. And again, the New Testament covers that we we're not bound by that law anymore because it's been fulfilled. Not abolished, it's been fulfilled. There's a difference. He didn't come to destroy the law. It's not destroyed. It has just been fulfilled. But um, even the dietary restrictions, they had a purpose. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to see this in the New Testament because, I mean, these people think that we still need to be following these dietary laws today. And I've heard some people say, well, you know, I don't think we necessarily have to do it today, but I do it just because... You know, I think it's wise because there's a good reason for not eating these other unclean things. So I was like, whatever, you know. If you think that way, I don't care, but it's still, um, I don't think that's necessarily even biblical. I mean, if you want to not eat certain things because you think they're unclean, because like shrimp eat off the, you know, the garbage that's in the ocean and, and they're kind of dirty, so I don't want to eat that, well, whatever. I enjoy shrimp, but I'm going to eat them, and I don't think there's any problem with it. And um, we're gonna, I'm going to show you that that was also the case because... This idea of uh, these dietary restrictions, not just the idea, the actual laws covering the dietary restrictions were instituted at one point and lasted up until essentially the New Testament, up until um, Jesus Christ brought in that New Testament. That was the extent of that portion of the law. It wasn't around prior to, to the Mosaic law, and it's not around after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, this law has been fulfilled. But, and, and we'll see the reason why it wasn't around before and, and why they're, they're misunderstanding what a clean beast is back when Noah was getting the beasts on the ark. Okay, because we're going to see very, very clearly, I'm going to prove it from Scripture, that he was not bound by these dietary restrictions. And, and you see, here's the thing. I do believe that prior, because there was this, this whole time that existed before God's word was penned down, before it was written down, right? I mean, we read about these stories in Genesis. We read about these stories in Genesis about Noah and about, you know, even Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of these events that happened. They all happened prior to God's word just being written down and translated. It wasn't until, because this, this is called the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible are the books of Moses. Moses is the one that wrote these books down. Moses is the one who's giving us the written record of all of this history. So we don't necessarily know everything that they knew in the Old Testament. Now, we do know that the gospel was preached unto them. The Bible talks about the gospel being preached unto Abraham, that Abraham obeyed the gospel. Abraham knew the gospel. He believed in the gospel. Now, did Abraham know the name of Jesus Christ? No. 
He didn't know that name. It wasn't revealed yet. But he knew the gospel. He knew there was going to be a Savior. Girls, Elizabeth, sit over there right now. They knew salvation was by grace through faith, as it always has been. They were never saved by their works. They were never saved by these sacrifices. Their, their eternal life, their soul, did not rest in whether or not they, they performed one of these sacrifices. That is not where their salvation came from. It has always been by grace through faith. Read Romans chapter 4. Read the book of Galatians. Read the book of Hebrews. You understand that. But, um, but they did know something. The, the people in, the, you know, in those times, they, they were taught by God. Exactly to what extent they knew, we don't necessarily know that. But I, what I'm claiming is that they were not bound by these dietary restrictions. That is not something that was given to them that they had to obey at that time. This is something that was instituted during, you know, when the Levitical priesthood was instituted under the Mosaic Law. And um, let's look at, you're in Acts chapter 10, look at verse number 9. Because we're going to see how these dietary restrictions, first of all, they don't apply to us today. The New Testament makes this clear. Verse 9 says, On the morrow... As they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, Peter has this vision. And his vision is from God. This isn't just some vision that's, that's you know, from a devil or, or just out of his own heart. You can say, well, Peter was hungry and he wanted to eat. That's why he had this vision. Well, God gave him this, this vision because it's, I mean, it's in the Bible. It's coming from the Spirit and it's claiming what God hath cleansed. That call not thou common or unclean. This is coming from God. And um, we see very clearly here there's things he says that you know four-footed beasts of the earth wild beasts creeping things if you remember what we saw in leviticus 11 it says not to eat any of the creeping things because it's abominable unto you so he's saying you can't eat that that's an abomination unto god but now there's this this whole vessel comes down and it has creeping things in it and god's saying take peter eat you can eat this now and Peter's saying, well, no, 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 I'm not going to eat that because I know the law. And, and he did. I mean, he, he was right in saying that because this is what he knew. But he didn't understand the, the purpose of the law. Because all of God's laws have a meaning and a purpose. And, and oftentimes they're very symbolic. As we mentioned already about the Passover, it was symbolic. That blood of the goats and the bulls, they didn't wash away their sins. It was a symbolism of the future sacrifice. So, this dietary laws and restrictions... It wasn't so that they can just be healthier. As some people try to claim, like, oh, nope, because they're dirty and these are clean and that's just going to be healthier for them so God made them only eat those animals. Then why would he say take and eat to these, other, to these creatures now if it was going to be bad for them? And he shouldn't do that. God wouldn't tell him to do that. And, um, and here we can see very clearly from this vision, it says what God hath cleansed that call not thou common. So, that cleaning it means that it was unclean, because it was, it was part of the law, it was unclean to them to eat, but now God has cleansed those things. And he says, okay, once I've cleansed it, you better not be calling it unclean. But people today in the Hebrew Roots Movement are going to say, those animals are unclean. And what I'm saying is that, hey, what God hath cleansed, you better not call that common or unclean. Peter didn't know any better because he's just in that transition period from the Old Testament to the New Testament and they're still learning and these things are being revealed unto them. Hey, that's been done away with. That's taken care of at this time. And this, this was made apparent unto Peter. And what we see later is that the, the, the more symbolic reference to this, it wasn't just because of the animals. Now all of a sudden they're, they're, they're clean just for no reason. It was symbolic because he was going unto someone that was a Gentile. 
And before, they didn't have the dealings with the Gentiles. Now, God's opened it up to everybody. It's not, you know, it says, Then, therefore, hath God give, granted uh, repentance unto, unto the Gentiles also. Because he goes and he preaches unto this man, who is not a Jew, he was not an Israelite, and, um, and he gets saved. And his whole household gets saved, and they, and they see the Holy Spirit comes down on them, and, and, and they're able to speak with other tongues, and they see this evidence yeah, these guys are truly saved. And um, the purpose of this vision was to show Peter that it's okay to go out now and, and, and you know, go out to the Gentiles. Go out. Whereas in the, in the Old Testament, God had chosen Israel. He had chosen these people to be the place where his name was going to be. Because of all these other nations and all these different gods, he said, this is going to be the nation. This is going to be the lighthouse. This is going to be beacon. That's, that's the place of truth. I'm going to have my, you know, his tabernacle was there and then later his temple was there. And he said, and, and, this, and these are the people he used to reveal himself unto mankind was through the Jews, through the Israelites. All of the prophets, they, they're all part of that nation. These are the people he used to get to, to let people know who he was. And we see it. It wasn't just because he was a racist, because we see other people were allowed to come and join themselves to the nation of Israel and become an Israelite. And they were welcome to come and do that. It wasn't just for this particular race, but this is just the people that he chose to say, okay, you know, Abraham was a friend of mine, and I'm going to use you guys. I'm going to use him and his family. And there's going to come a seed of him that, you know, for prophetic purposes to show this is God, all these things are going to come to pass. I mean, he, he decided to use people to do it. These are the people he used to do it. And um, now he's saying that, okay, it's no longer going to be focused just in Jerusalem and just in this nation. It's going to be spread abroad everywhere. And we're still supposed to be set apart and sanctified, yes, but the symbolism of the dietary restriction of the clean animals versus the unclean animals, he's lifted. And, you know, that's how they viewed the Gentiles. They viewed them as unclean animals. But he says, no, no more. What God has cleansed, don't call that unclean. And that's why it was, it was okay seeing, okay, yeah, we can go and, and do this because it's a change in the law. And, um, you know, what we believe is that the Old Testament laws... They're still in effect unless we see that they've been fulfilled through the New Testament. I mean, here is very clear. Peter had a vision. Okay, well, that aspect of the law has been fulfilled. And again, I'm not going to go through all that, but unless it's been specifically mentioned as, as, as being, um, I don't want to say done away with because it's not abolished, but it's not observed anymore because it's been fulfilled. Um, the New Testament is very clear about what, which ordinances are dealt with because of that. Now, so if it wasn't because of dietary zero, we see that it's not in effect today based on what we saw in Acts chapter 10 and in other places. I'm not going to go into the whole, an entire ser sermon about that, which you could um, just on this one topic. It's not in effect today. We saw when it was in effect with Leviticus chapter 11 with Mosaic, the Mosaic Law. Then why did it say for Noah to bring clean beasts? Right? Well, it's very simple. It wasn't the dietary restrictions they needed for us because he needed clean beasts for an offering. It wasn't just for his food. Look at Genesis 8. We're going we're to look at Genesis 8, verse 20. The Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And we saw the sacrifices had been going on going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Remember, Adam and Eve were in the garden. After they sinned, God made a coat of skins for them. Well, a sacrifice had to be made in order for them to get that coat of skins. So the sacrifices had been going on, and we have biblical evidence for this all throughout history. That did not originate with the Mosaic Law. The sacrifices have been given. I mean, Cain and Abel. Right? They both brought offerings. Abel brought the correct offering. It was, a, it was an animal sacrifice unto the Lord. I mean, it goes all the way back. So Noah knew about sacrifices, of course. And God had rules that he had given them about only using clean animals, 
clean beasts to him that were offered up for offerings as a sacrifice. It's, I mean, this, this had to be the way it was. I mean, he didn't, he didn't accept Cain's offering. He had rules for it, even though he didn't lay out for us the exact rules that they followed necessarily in the Bible. But, it, it, you know, they, they definitely had them. They knew about it. So, but this wasn't for what he was able to eat. This is for what he was offering unto God. And obviously, you can't just bring two if he's going to be offering animals up unto God because then they'd just be extinct. For the, for first, the first time he, he offers one up for a sacrifice, they're gone. So he needed to have seven because he's doing, these are the animals he's going to continue to use for sacrifices unto God. They need a head start with their procreation because he's going to be killing them. Right? Makes sense. And then look at um, Genesis 9. I'm going to prove to you, now clearly, Noah was not under this dietary restriction. Because I still haven't proven that to you from the Bible that, that he wasn't under this law. But Genesis 9, verse 3, this is after the flood now. Noah gets off the ark. It says in verse number 3 of chapter 9, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. And then he gives one caveat. He says, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So, does this say anything about the cloven foot and the hoof and all this other stuff that we see in Leviticus 11? No, not at all. He just says everything. Everything that moveth is yours to eat. Go ahead, eat up, Noam. Now, Again, you know, people today will like to say, oh, well, I just think it's wise to follow these dietary restrictions because there's these beasts that are unclean, so I don't want to have anything to do with them. Why would he tell Noah that it was okay? Why would he tell Peter that it was okay? There were no dietary restrictions for Noah and going all the way back. Um, and actually, even going back to like Adam and Eve, it was, they didn't even eat animals. They ate just the, the herbs of the field and, and the fruit of the trees and things like that. But, um, you know, Noah was able to eat everything that moves. Peter's able to eat everything that moves. So it's just that one time frame where we have these dietary restrictions in place. And um, I think that's very clearly shown in evidence from the Bible. So don't let these guys try to fool you with um, you know, coming up with some other verses from um, the Mosaic Law or the Levitical Law to, to say, oh, you shouldn't be eating that stuff today as a Christian. Because it's not true. It's a lie. Um, it's clearly been repealed. But let's go back to Genesis 7. Genesis chapter 7, verse number 4 says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Now, I love that phrase because we saw that again in chapter at the very end of chapter 6. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. Verse number seven, or chapter 7, verse 5, And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And we went into how great faith he had. But look at verse number 4, back up. He says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So he gives them this warning. When he hits the seven-day mark before God's going to bring the flood, because remember, it was about 120 years when God said, You know, my, you know, my spirit should not always strive with man. He's going he's gonna to destroy man from off the face of the earth. And he tells Noah, hey, you need to build this ark. So it's this massive ark. He starts to build this big boat. And, um, but now he gets this, this seven-day warning. It's like, the, it's like the two minute warning in football, right? It's like, okay, we're coming up near the end. This is crunch time. This is go time. So he says, one week from today, in seven days, the flood's coming. You know, he's been preparing for the past hundred years. And now it's coming in seven days. So just make sure you're ready. And some people will, will teach that, that they actually, Noah and his family actually got into the ark and just waited for seven days. Um, that doesn't really make any sense to me. I don't think that's true. And actually, there's scripture to show that like, look at verse number 13 of chapter 7. It says, In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wives, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. The self-same day, the self -same day that, it, that, that the, it started to rain. That's when he actually went into the ark. And 
you know, I don't know. There, there's obviously a lot of animals that went into the ark. And just the sheer number of the animals going in and, and getting them in the right place is going to take time. I mean, just physically, it just, it's going to take time for them to come, to walk, to get into their place you know, and everything else. Even with God guiding them and directing them, it's still going to take time to do all this stuff. That's why I think he gave them a week's notice. Like, okay, we're doing this now. So he's starting to get everything, you know, all the animals in, all the insects in, in their places. And, you know, it's interesting when you think about, like, how did he do that? You know, like, because he's keeping the creeping things, everything alive. He wants that little, like, panels on the wall or something for him to be put in there. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird, you know, where they're just flying around. I mean, I wouldn't think he'd have, like, the mosquitoes. Oh, I guess the mosquitoes might not have needed to be on the ark. I don't know. Um, with the water outside, but um, be like, oh no, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just killed the mosquito. <laughs> Too bad he didn't, man. No. <laughs> Everything has a purpose. I don't know what the purpose of mosquitoes is other than to vex us, but um, he must not have had those just loose flying around for that very purpose. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it would have taken a lot of time, a lot of work. He wasn't just sitting around with his family saying, okay, we're just waiting now. And I think this is taught in, in kind of in connection with people thinking that like somehow they tie it in with the pre-trib rapture. I don't know for sure. I haven't heard very much of it, but I know that it's taught out there. But um, that's not the case. And we see even in Luke 17, you have to turn there, Luke 17, it talks about where it does tie it in with end time events. It says, and as it was in the days of Noe, talking about Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So he's saying, you know, everything was just fine. And this is how the world was at this time too. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage. You know, they're, they're living life. Everything's just fine. Now, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I think he was preaching to the people, destruction's coming. You know, they had to be wondering, why are you building this great ark? Why are you even doing this? Because God's going to destroy the earth. That's why. But they didn't care. They're living life. Ah, yeah, whatever. That, that old man's crazy. That, that old Noah, that, that, that guy's a kook, man. That guy's nuts. I don't know what he's talking about. And they're just, just living life and doing what they want to do. And, you know, obviously we see that he wasn't nuts. But um, it's the same way. It's gonna be, and he says this is going to be the same way when Jesus Christ comes back. The coming of the Son of Man. Yeah, people are going to be living their life. They're not going to think there's any danger. No need to worry. Pfft. Yeah, these, these, these tinfoil hat wearers over here, they think God's going to come down and destroy the whole world and all this other stuff. They're crazy. They're nuts. Uh, no, he is. He's done it once. We've got, we've got the history of it right here. He destroyed the world with a flood. And is he going to destroy it with a flood again? No. No, but he's going to rain fire and brimstone down upon this earth. And he's going to do all kinds of other plagues. And he's going to come back in judgment. And people ought not to scoff at it as they did in Noah's day. But that is what's going to happen. Um, we already know. But we see here in this verse, what, the whole reason I was going there anyways in Luke 17 is to point out that until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So everything was just fine until that day. And it's going to be the same thing until the day, the day that Jesus Christ comes back, everyone's going to think everything's just fine. And then, boom, that day is going to mark the wrath of God. And it's not going to be fine. Because that same day is the same day that the flood came, right? Um, God poured out his wrath upon this earth in that manner. So, Another misconception about the flood is just because, you know, it's a common story, but a lot of people don't really read into it. They just, they just kind of go off what they were taught as kids, and they think that the flood only lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. They'll think, oh yeah, no, the animals are on the ark, 40 days, 40 nights, flood is over. And that's actually not true. The Bible says that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But that's not how long the flood lasted. The flood lasted much longer than that. Let, let's, look, let's look at what the Bible says about the flood. Look at verse number 11 of Genesis chapter 7. Because it gives us the exact time and how long this lasted. In the 600th year of Noah's life. So Noah's exactly 600 years old. Right? In the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So, so much stuff to, to, to get, dig into here. But let's, just, let's use our months, 
right? I know they didn't call them, and they're not even necessarily at the same time, but just for sake of just kind of getting our head around this, Noah's 600 years old. In Febu on February 17th, right, is when the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, notice this too, because most people, again, you think of the flood, they just think, well, it rained. And, and, and that's where the floodwaters came from. And people will even scoff and mock the Bible and say, well, there's no way it could have, there could have been enough water in heaven for it to rain so much to have this great flood. And that's true. I mean, like scientific speaking, you couldn't have that much, just, just that much rain to pour upon the earth for it to flood the earth the way it did. But it wasn't just the rain. The Bible says the, great, the fountains of the great deep were broken up too. So there's water under the earth as well as the water above the earth. So it's coming from both directions. And that's one of the reasons why it was able to flood relatively so fast. And people were, and everyone was able to die because the water was coming up from out of the ground. And then the water was also you know, was gushing out from wherever, from where it was broken up. And it was also coming down from the sky. And it says the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now jump down to verse number 17. It says, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And then jump down to verse number 24. It says, and the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So now we're seeing, okay, the rain lasted for 40 days and 40 nights, but now it's saying the, the, the waters prevailed for an 150 day. And that word prevail is kind of important because... Um, trying to think of it, you know, prevailed is like it was increasing and going up and continuing to rise and just prevailing over the thing. But it still doesn't mean that all the water was gone within 150 days. That's when the water was prevailing and kind of at its worst. 150 days, that's five months, right? Five months on this ark of the water prevailing. Now, but the time that Noah was actually on the ark before he got out was even longer than that. It was even longer than five months. Look at um, chapter 7, verse 11. So there we see, well, we are going over this. The 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, 17th day of the month. But then look at chapter 8, because chapter 8 is when he gets off the ark. Verse 13. And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So he, he saw dry land. And remember, it was like February 17th when the floods came in, the, in his 600th year. So then the 601st year, so one year later, the next calendar year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth, so he takes the ark, off, the covering off the ark um, that was protecting him from the rain, and he looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. But then look at verse 14. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. So the waters actually, like, like the flood was completely over, and the land finally dried up and everything in basically February 27th. So that's just over one full year from when the flood started, from the very first day. That's a long time. And again, most people kind of, you think of the ark, you think of, yeah, 40 days and 40 nights, yeah, there's a flood, everything else. He was on that ark for a year with those animals and, and you know, living in that condition. And um, that's, that's pretty interesting that he was on there for that long. Most people don't even you know, think about it or realize that. But he was on the ark for a long time. Now, in each of these chapters that talk about the flood, like this one in chapter 8, we're going to see evidence that shows that the flood must have been a worldwide flood. Because there's a lot of people out there today, and I think they show this on like the um, Discovery Channel, things like that. Like they do mysteries of the Bible. And they basically just, just blaspheme the Word of God, just try to, to show you that, oh, what the Bible said, that's not really true. It's actually meant this. And... People will believe that it was just a localized flood. Like it was just in that area. You know, there's no way it covered everything. That's kind of silly. That's impossible. And they'll try to tell you scientifically why that couldn't have happened. Like one, like with the rain. 
But again, it's because they're not reading the whole Bible where it says the fountains of the deep were, were, were broken up as well as the rain coming down from heaven. Um, just this time frame. I mean, if it was just localized, do you really think it would have taken an entire year for the ground to dry up? I mean, that's a long, that's a long time. But not just that. We're going to see some other reasons too. Because um, he was on, he was on ark for a long time. But look at, um, let's look at verse number 18. We're almost done. The Bible says, And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And look at this. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So, Again, to refute the whole, you know, this localized earth, the localized flood thing, it says all the high hills under the whole heaven. I mean, that's under everything that's under the sky, right? If you're, you know, if you were to look up, the sky that you see here is not just local to here. I mean, you could be really far away and look up and you can, you can look around. Anything that I, when I look around at the whole horizon and everywhere, the sky that is, that is, exists over those parts is a really big area of land, right? So even if you were to say, well, when he says under the whole heaven, that only means what Noah was able to see. Okay, I mean, that's not what the Bible says, but even if we use that, I mean, that's huge. But then answer me this, because it says, all the high hills that were in the whole heaven, verse number 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. If the mountains are covered in, in our local area, where's that water going to go? Does the water just stay like, like somehow in this invisible barrier, just still localized so that those mountains are covered? No, that's stupid. It's, it's not like the Red Sea crossing here. The Bible says they were covered, they were underwater. Which means, and if the tops of them are covered, the water is going to start flowing before, because a mountain isn't just this big mesa, like a plateau, just all across the land. Mountains have valleys. They go up and down, right? I mean, that's what a mountain is. They have low points and high points. So in order for the water to cover the tops of the mountain, I know this is really, really difficult science, right? I mean, it's just, just bear with me, right? The water is going to be flowing in between the mountains, and continuing to go as far as it can go, right? I mean, in order for it to stop flooding, it would, it would, it would have to dry up or go into the land. But if that's the case, it's going to keep moving out before it's moving up. Yeah. It has to have some type of barrier to get to where it's, where it's going to, you know, for it to start rising. And in order for it to cover the tops of the mountains by 15 cubits, I mean, it has to have already gone really far. And, I mean, once it covers the tops of the mountain, it's going to, you know, it's going to keep on going. And then you'd, you'd see that top of the mountain. It can't be covered unless it's got nowhere to go. And again, a whole other reason why this had to be a worldwide flood. It says in verse 21, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Of all that was in the dry land died, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping thing and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Total devastation. The Bible says nothing survived. It doesn't say nothing locally. It just says every single animal that was on the face of the earth died. Man, creatures, insects, everything was wiped out. This is God's wrath being poured out. I mean, he was sorry that he even made the creation to begin with. He's sorry that he made man, and as a result, I'm going to wipe it all out. And if that was his attitude, and that was his reasoning for destroying his, you know, mankind, why would he only do it locally? Because here's the thing. You can make an argument to say, well, the people still kind of stuck together. For those over a thousand years since Adam and Eve, they're going to say these people still, you know, kind of stayed together and God just had to destroy all the men. But he didn't just destroy all the men. And we know 
from Cain that he was a nomad and a vagabond. He roamed the earth. He didn't stay in one place. Cain had a lot of descendants too. It wasn't just Cain. He had all kinds of descendants. They were spread out. They were spreading out over there. That's not just localized. And even if you could try to argue that, that men kind of stayed together localized, over a thousand years, what about the animals? There's no way that the animals are just going to stick together. All animals, all insects, all the beasts, everything, they're just going to stick together. They're going to stay by the men, right? Because that's what animals do. They like staying by mankind. <laughs> mankind is going to hunt them and kill them and eat them. Uh, that's stupid. Animals don't do that today unless they're extremely overpopulated and, and there's nowhere for them to go. And, you know, like, because people don't allow hunting and, and they just allow these deer or whatever else to just run all over the place. But typically, I mean, animals are afraid of mankind, of humans. They're going to get away from them. That's why when you build in a certain area, the animals move out, the people move in. And for over a thousand years of existence, of, of creation of, of animals and beasts and insects and everything else, I mean, they breed abundantly. They're going to be all over the place. So in order to kill all of them, you can't kill them all in just a localized flood. It would have to cover everything. And in order to kill them all, they can't be climbing up into a higher, into higher land, into higher ground. I mean, there's lots of animals that live on mountains and live on the sides of mountains. How are you going to make sure they're all killed unless it's a worldwide flood? It doesn't make any sense otherwise. Don't let people try to you know, shake your faith in the Bible, oh, this, give you all these reasons, oh, no, no, see, I've got an explanation, there's no way that could have been a worldwide flood, it had to just be localized, it had to just be in this small part, you know, the Bible's just, you, you know, talking figuratively, figuratively when it says every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground. That doesn't sound too figurative to me, it just, it sounds to me like every living substance was destroyed from the face of the ground. I mean, I, I take the Bible for what it says, and um, hopefully you do too. Um, there's no way, and we'll, we'll see a few more examples of this as we go through in, in, in chapter 8. But um, nothing survived, and here we see you know, the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So 150 days, that water was just, I mean, it was rising, going up, and just really high. And we're going to see later where the boat, the ark finally starts to rest, and the mountains, uh, I mean, it was above the mountains. When the water starts to decrease, then it's able to, to rest in the mountains, not even a valley. I mean, it, again, more proof. God is showing, like, the entire earth was covered with water. The whole face of the earth was covered with water. And, um, you know, and I, and I meant to do this, and I forgot, actually, because people have a, such a hard time believing this, right? But what do you hear about when you hear about all this global warming stuff, if the ice caps were to melt, you know, the water level is going to rise. And if, even if it rises just like a couple feet, that's total devastation because all of these coastal areas would just be underwater and every, you know, the whole geography of the world is going to be different if it just changes a little bit. I mean, this is what you're told by scientists today. And people will accept that and that's just, I mean, that's just a little bit of melting of, of these ice caps. Why would it be so difficult to even think that, well, maybe there weren't ice caps at this time. And if there were, maybe they melted. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying they did. I don't, you know, the Bible doesn't say that. But I'm just saying, like, I don't, I don't necessarily, there's no reason to believe that, uh, that there necessarily even were ice, ice caps in, at this time at all. You know, the, the whole... Without the rain and with the great fountains of the deep being, being broken up, you know, that had a significant impact on climate change. <laughs> just, just those events, this, you know, with, with the raining and, and, and the floods. I mean, that's, uh, that, that changed, I believe that changed the way that the earth is, is, um, appears in, in the, the land and everything else. I mean, I, I believe that's where, like, the Grand Canyon came from. I believe that's where a lot of our other, um, land structures came from this flood, from this massive, uh, you know, everything being underwater. That's why you can see, find seashells and stuff on the tops of mountains. You know, the evidence is there and it lines up exactly with what the Bible already tells us that we know to be the truth. But uh, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your words, for the Bible, dear God. And um, 
Lord, we love that you've given us the truth. We know that your word is the truth, dear Lord. And, um, and help us not to be shaken by science that's falsely so-called, by people that, that hate you and um, don't want to accept that you're real and, um, and accept your authority in their life, dear Lord. So they want to come up with any excuse possible to try to deny the existence or the truth of your words, Lord. But we, uh, we know that it's true. And um, the evidence is so clear from your word if we would just listen to it and receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.